Okay, so today we are moving on to Soren Kierkegaard, and I've chosen two dialogues for you. Um, uh, one is called The Concept of Anxiety, and the other one, um, which is probably the more difficult and we'll spend a bit more time on, um, is Sickness Unto Death. Um, I, the first of these videos, I'm just going to say some general things about um, the way that Kierkegaard is starting this work. Um, and I suppose the first thing that I should acknowledge is that um, you might notice that it's the essential Kierkegaard, but nonetheless, um, it's got all of these other bylines. Uh, Virgilis uh, 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 Hoffman. Phyllis is, 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 uh, who is a Watchman character uh, for the concept of anxiety, and I've horribly pronounced that. Um, and the other one uh, by a fellow by the name of Anticlimacus. What Kierkegaard is doing here, um, he has more pseudonyms than I've got pairs of socks. And, and basically what he is trying to do in his writing, every time he takes up a pseudonym, he takes up a perspective from which to argue. Right? If I were going to make an argument from this perspective, he creates an entire persona, a kind of person who would make that kind of argument in order to follow it through to its conclusion. All of these dialogues, um, all of these, these, these writings, these works, um, are at least edited by Soren Kierkegaard. There's some of his that are actually, you know, not written um, under pseudonyms um, and written by Soren Kierkegaard himself, but nonetheless, that is what he is doing. Basically, he's trying to um, take up a perspective on a particular kind of problem. Right? Now, in these dialogues, these are companion dialogues, um, uh, basically, and uh, all of his work actually, starts from an interesting perspective, a perspective of uh, the existing individual. A few of the uh, supplementary videos that um, I've provided for you um, acknowledge that Kierkegaard was actually very concerned about developments um, not only in modern philosophy but modern society as well what um, the Enlightenment and uh, modern philosophy was very good at producing were systems, right? Systems to make choices, systems to uh, properly run a government, systems to um, live your life, systems to do your work, systems to keep track of inventory, systems to system, system, systems, right? And it, what Kierkegaard was very concerned about is that uh, given the predominance of all of these systems ways of thinking about fitting into a human society, we wind up just being cogs in a bureaucratic wheel. Now, um, a good way to think about this in terms of our modern society um, is uh, to think about, uh, let's say, for example, assembly line work. Right? You show up and you are a warm body that is performing a function on an assembly line. Go down to the DIA and look at um, Diego Rivera's mural, D Detroit Industry. You'll see all of these bodies and these heroic kind of motions, doing this, doing that, smelting, pouring, uh, moving things along the assembly line and that sort of thing. But nonetheless, effectively what it is, is repetitively and unreflectively repeating the same sort of behavior over and over and over again. So too with bureaucracy, so too with um, military discipline. This is what discipline is. It gets you to sort of <coughs> unreflectively and immediately follow your orders or go through the, uh, the, 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 the sort of set of practices that you're supposed to. And I mean, I can even liken this to my lifeguard training. Immediately, you just go into the mode and go through and... I mean, if you're a nursing major, you know that there are procedures that you just you just go into your mode and you do them, right? Now, Kierkegaard was very concerned about the prevalence of this kind of thinking. Mind you, not not this kind of thinking itself, because we need we need systems in order to produce goods, in order to uh, d d produce medical help, um, that sort of thing. He's not anti-system; he's anti a kind of 
cultural sensibility in which we reduce our selves and our ways of making choices and living our lives and being human beings to systems right so the concept of anxiety and sickness unto death are both dialogues as is much of Kierkegaard's work that would have a start not from the perspective um, from above right from a systems perspective to see how we fit as a cog in a giant machine but rather they start from the existing individual's perspective you see what Kierkegaard what scared him most about his culture was that I mean effectively it, they were all men they were all members of an official religion right they were all effectively religious right they went to church they kneeled at the right times they stood at the right times they repeated back um, they sang the right songs everybody knew the words and that sort of thing but the problem is if everybody is well of course religious nobody really is right and he saw this as a more general problem as well right um it, it the, the 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 partially examined life podcast do a great job of introducing this as does roderick um it basically what Kierkegaard was fearful of is that uh, it, it, given given this sort of enlightenment bureaucratic sort of disposition that most of the people from his day actually share right effectively what we've lost is the ability to be individuals that is be ourselves make our choices realize the full weight of those choices look ourselves in the face and or in the mirror and 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 say yes to ourselves so these two di dialogues the concept of anxiety and sickness unto death are dialogues about anxiety and despair and basically what Kierkegaard considers this is first well one Christian psychological right so the first Christian and secondly psychological right there are commentaries that point out that Kierkegaard is not interested in using psychology to overcome dogma but rather using psychology to understand the point of view the situation of the person wrapped up in a system of dogmas if you really believe the things that your culture claims to believe these are the difficulties that you would should and necessarily will actually experience and the sorts of breakdowns that happen when we actually free, flee from the full weight of our situations so basically these psychological christian dialogues right are not meant to have you overcome anxiety or overcome despair like completely rooted out cure it right but rather confront and work through Another way of thinking about these dialogues is it generally it's, it's, it, 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 they're, they're, they're psychological, right? But when we go to a psychologist today, Roderick does a good job of explaining that, we might point and say, I'm feeling anxious. Help me. Fix it, right? Or I'm, I'm in despair. Help me. Fix it. Get rid of it, right? And generally, um, there are two methods that the psychologist today will will usually not always but usually sort of employ one right is to pathologize right that is you know you it, it, to, to identify the sort of syndromes that you are making your choices on the basis of right oh well I've got a diagnosis for you what you have is this effective situational sort of anxiety disorder right and step two is Medicaid give you something to you know sort of dull right the anxiety or the despair that you are experiencing Kierkegaard, on the other hand, wants you to confront and work through these necessary structural kind of 
experiences, right, anxiety and despair, work through it psychologically yourself. He points out that we experience anxiety and we experience despair because we are human beings and human beings are qualified as spirit. I know, spirit, right? It's like I'm going to wind up hang, handing out Bibles or preaching on a soapbox on a corner or something along those lines. Um, if if you were irreligious, as as the partially examined point, uh, 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 life kind of um, podcast points out, uh, the word doesn't have to alienate you, right? Um, effectively, this is the way I've been explaining it for a long time now. When you see a word like spirit, it doesn't have a, a technical kind of meaning, right? It's I I tend to think that Kierkegaard means something fairly simple with regard to spirit. He simply means the same sort of thing that we mean when we've got like school spirit, right? Or we are a, a spirited arguer, that is, we care, right? We give a damn. We're not just here and uh, syndromes that respond in programmed and, 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 and habituated kind of ways. But rather, when we make choices, when we make actions, when we dispose ourselves to ourselves and the relationships that make up our lives, we give a damn. We care. We're not just here. We're not just, as Kierkegaard points out, this, this, this combination of an analytic mind and a physical body. Right? But rather, we're a synthesis of these things insofar as we care. We care, right? This is what defines us. Now, the concept of anxiety starts with an interesting thought experiment, right? Effectively, he starts out by, you know, and this is this is a technique of Kierkegaard's, right? Basically, taking scripture, right, taking religious texts and parables as thought experiments and trying to work through what these parables or these writings tell the existing individual about how to make choices, how to dispose themselves to their lives, how to, you know, sort of through faith, meet their lives head on, right? So what he does is he picks up a story from Genesis, right? The notion of original sin, which is sort of a weird puzzle, isn't it, right? God says to Adam and Eve, don't eat from this tree, this tree of the knowledge, of, 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 of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Do not eat. Right? And where does original sin come from? Well, they ate from the tree. But as a consequence of eating from this tree, they acquire the knowledge of good and evil. So before they ate from the tree, they were innocent and had no knowledge of good and evil. Original sin happens as a consequence of being supplied by the very distinction that would allow them to understand the prohibition in the first place. Right? So in what sense could Adam and Eve have possibly understood the prohibition? If, only after having eaten from the forbidden fruit, they would be able to understand the distinction between good and evil, and therefore sin. Right? Now, what Kierkegaard wants to do is account for how original sin is possible right? structurally, before conceptual distinctions. To a certain extent, he wants to point out that, you know, because we are qualified as spirit, right? Because we are free, we can experience anxiety as sort of the dizziness of freedom. Adam and Eve use language. Adam and Eve were free. They made choices. They could have eaten from the tree. It, the fruit of the tree or not, right? And as a result of that confrontation with freedom's possibilities already structurally built in 
eh, was the capacity for sin. Eh? Now, the podcast, the Examined Life pos podcast, actually does a good job of presenting you with, with freedom's possibilities in this way. What is it that makes us anxious, right? You see, this is, Kierkegaard, in both of these dialogues, is asking, you know, fairly simple kinds of questions that I'll try to contextualize for you a bit before we get into the nitty-gritty of the text. Uh, the, 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 the first dialogue, the concept of anxiety, it's, it's, it, what does it mean to be an existing individual and make choices that matter? Right? And uh, the companion question along with that, how do we generally fail to live up to this kind of freedom, this kind of choice, Right, this kind of meaningful activity wherein we're individuals. Now, most of us, myself included, right, find ourselves in our lives making choices that seem necessary. Right? It just seems necessary. Well, first you do this, and then you do that, and then you do that, and what's a boy to do, right? You just, you just make the choices as though they're not even really choices. So to a certain extent, Kierkegaard would point out, we're fleeing from our freedom. Right? Every now and again, we're confronted with so many options that, uh, how do we even choose? Right? So there is this tension between freedom and necessity that actually makes up our existence. And anxiety, Right, is a perfectly natural reaction to that. We should feel anxious. Right? We should feel anxious because we are free. We have an infinite number of possibilities. There's nothing we really need to do. Right? I'm recording this video to you today because in some sense in the back of my mind I'm saying, well, I've got to do this video for my students. I could just press stop and say that's good enough. I've given you the... and not do it. Right. Well, I've got to do it because it's my job, etc., etc. I could quit. Right. I don't have to do this job. I could do other things. I could do nothing. Right. And deal with the consequences as they come. Right. You see, this is how Kierkegaard, in these two dialogues, is in addition to um, being characterized as the father, father of modern psychology, is sort of characterized as the great-grandfather of existentialism, right? He starts from that perspective of the existing individual. Okay, we're thrown into the world. Now what do we do, right? What sort of dispositions do we have to... Okay, well, we are free, right? But that means we are free with all of these possibilities that make us dizzy, right? And we're responsible as well. We have to make choices, and we have to make choices and deal with the consequences, and we have to make choices if we're going to live a good and meaningful life that have some fundamental value or meaning. Right? Likewise, with despair, we are thrown into a world, and our existence is made up of all of these relationships. Say five interesting things about yourself. And what you'll notice about those five interesting things that you can say about yourself is that they are all ways of relating to other people. Right? We'll pick on me. I'm a father. I'm a husband. Right? I'm a philosopher. I'm a professor. I'm a son. Keep going. I'm a member of a community. Right? I'm an amateur gardener. Right? You can see from... I should be an aloe farmer with that monster aloe behind me, etc., etc. But these are all ways of relating to the world. The things that you say about yourself that are interesting are not just about you, about, but things that describe dispositions to relationships that you've got with people and things in the world, with people, things, system, systems right, in the world. Right? So, effectively, right, the human being isn't a material thing. Effectively, the human being isn't a substantial thing. Being a human being is something that 
we assert. Right? And in Sickness Unto Death, he points out that there are, well, three basic ways of running away from this. Three ways of evasively turning away from having selves, from being ourselves. The first, right, Roderick points out, is kind of like we see in a zombie movie. Zombies are interesting examples of this, right? Uh, what is a zombie, right? It's, I don't care if you're a fast zombie, a slow zombie, a Night of the Living Dead zombie, um, a, a zombie plague zombie, a magical zombie, that sort of thing. Effectively, zombies all have two things in common. One, they're us. And two, they are divorced of everything that makes us, in any real sense, us. Right? What is it about a zombie? They are human beings that no longer care. You can punch them, kick them, chop their arms off, kick them in the head, yell harsh things at them, etc., etc. They don't care. They don't care. Right? They are not relation. Horrible language that Kierkegaard is using here. Relations that relate themselves to themselves in the relation as the relation is just awful, right? But nonetheless, not even being aware of having a self. I experience this often, right? When I just go into zombie autopilot, okay, you just do this, you do that, you do the next thing, etc., etc. I've had jobs like this where you know, I look at up at the end of the day and where'd the time go, right? I haven't been here the entire time. I've just been a warm body taking up space, right? So you just go numb. I've had relationships like this, right? Where, you know, you just go, you just endure it, right? You just endure it. That's all, all right? You just turn yourself off and away you go, right? That's a way of not wanting to be yourself, running away from being a self in the first place, right? Then there is the despair not to will to be yourself. It's kind of a Charlie Brown, why me, good grief kind of thing, but a little bit deeper than that, right? Looking in the mirror and not wanting to be you. Yet, this doesn't relate in anything like suicide, or it result in anything like suicide, because suicide wouldn't solve it, right? It wouldn't solve it. That would just be another act of you doing that, right? So people just endure this kind of despair, and it's, I'm me, and I don't want to be me, etc., etc. You ever seen Kung Fu Panda, the first one, right? Kind of thing. It's, it's, I would describe the, the Kung Fu Panda Po as in this kind of despair when he's talking to Master Ugwe about how are you going to turn this into a Kung Fu master? It's, it's a form of self-hatred that he had. Right? And oddly, Kung Fu Panda is an awesome sort of example uh, to illustrate what Kierkegaard is going to... It's funny now that I've got kids, it's Kung Fu Panda that I use as examples, but nonetheless, right, it's sort of funny. Right. Pose in this kind of not wanting to be himself kind of despair. Right? And that's why he tries to become a Kung Fu master. Right? He, because he doesn't want to be him. Right? Now, oddly, the third kind of despair pose in as well. He wants to be the dragon warrior right? kind of thing. If everything would be okay if he were just the dragon warrior warrior, and that sort of thing. But that's kind of a, a, the same structurally, the same kind of despair in the first place. Right? Because everything would be okay, okay if I were this self, this self that's not me, that's over here. Right? That's the same thing you're saying and not wanting to be yourself. You want to be this other self that's not you. So you still don't want to be yourself. Now, Kierkegaard, and it's interesting, we'll explore um, all of this, right, um, presents uh, the solution to both anxiety and despair as faith.
right? which he describes as a qualitative leap, leap, but he actually means something fairly specialized with it. Well, in our discussion of sickness unto death, we'll get into it in a little bit more detail, but nonetheless, how do you know you're making the right choice with anxiety when you've got this dizziness of freedom and you're overwhelmed by all of these choices? Faith right, is the answer. Right? You're just going to make a choice and trust that everything works out. Right? Faith, either faith in yourself, right? I'm equal to making this choice. Right? Faith in uh, the kindness and benevolence of others, faith in systems, faith in the world, faith in the economic system, etc., etc., etc. You guys, you're choosing your majors right now, and you're probably dealing with a, a good deal of anxiety right now. How do you make the right choice? Right? You're training today for something that you're going to have to do in, you know, 20, 30 years. All right? How do we even know what the world is going to look like in 20, 30 years? I certainly would not have predicted this. Right? I wouldn't have predicted this as the kind of world. The iPhone's been out 10 years, right? Everybody's bloody well got one. Right? How would we have predicted that? Right? So, I mean, you, this style of education, it's kind of new, right? How would I have predicted this, right? How do we, how do we make choices in, in, from an infinite number of possible choices in an uncertain kind of future. Uh, you just got to choose and believe that things are going to work out. Faith, it's a qualitative leap. Uh, it's a choice that you have to keep making and making and making and making and making and making, and making again. Uh, let me just illustrate a little bit further how faith actually winds up it being the operative moment in terms of Kierkegaard. Right? I'll use this example a little later on again, but nonetheless, right? um, you know, my partner and I travel for work a lot. Right? We're in a committed relationship. This is one of the cornerstones of our relationship, why, it's, why and how it's a meaningful kind of relationship. We're committed to one another. And she and I both travel all over the world. Right, for our work. We're gone for a few, several days, weeks, sometimes. How do I know she's faithful to me? How do I know? I don't. That's the answer. How does she know I'm faithful to her? She doesn't. Yeah. Then how do we trust each other in the relationship? How? how on what basis? can, Given that we can't know on what basis do we can we trust one another? Well, Kierkegaard would point out that the answer has to be faith. That's what trust is. If we knew, right? If we somehow surveilled one another, tracked each other's phones, um, bugged each other, um, spied on each other, hired people to spy on one another, etc., 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 right? Trust would already be gone. We would already demonstrate that we don't trust one another and all of the value and meaning for the relationship would just be forfeit. Right? Why the relationship works, why it's meaningful, how it is valuable and adds, you know, richness and fullness to our life, it's faith. Faith, right? Really, if you think about the million little teeny tiny leaps of faith that you make on a daily basis, you'll be astounded. Things that you'll just, you just trust this to work out. You trust technology to work. You trust people not to run you off the street. You trust people not to run you down while walking on the sidewalk. You, 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 you go to, to the bank. You trust people not to shoot you and take your money. There are all of these little acts of faith that we make on a regular basis. They're little leaps, but it, they, they make it possible to live a human life. So Kierkegaard may be basing everything that he's saying in terms of 
scripture, religious texts, and religious belief. But he doesn't mean only something highfalutin about it, right? He's not, he's not making grandiose claims. He's trying to show that if you're going to be Christian, these are the problems that you're going to encounter. If you're going to be Christian in a meaningful way, rather than uh, the sort of stand, kneel, repeat back, put money in the collection bin, and be a card-carrying member of your church, right? that's different from really being someone who is religious. Faith is the key. And what's more, even if you're not a member of a church, right? even if you're not concerned about being a Christian, there's something that's been offered here right? that is valuable. It's valuable because really we can't use reason. We can't logic our way through these problems. Right? There's no way to use reason to overcome anxiety. It's psychological. It requires a disposition, and that disposition is one that requires a qualitative leap, a leap of faith, right, in order to overcome, in order to confront, in order to deal with, right? You want to be Christian? You don't want to be Christian. You're still going to have anxiety. You're either going to flee from it, right, hide behind systems to make your choices for you, right, hide behind systems to give your life meaning, right, but those things will fail and you'll fail to be an individual, right? Or you'll take some sort of a leap of faith. Right? So it all comes down to the human being as spirit. We give a damn. We care about ourselves. We're not just present. Right? We are here and we care. Right? So that's going to be sort of the key thing here. Right? So, anxiety and despair. Um, like I say, I'm focusing much more on um, the sickness unto death than I am on the concept of, of anxiety, but they go hand in hand, right? Um, it, anxiety is that sort of consciousness of being able, right? Later philosophers have picked up on this, for example, Simone de Beauvoir and Jean Paul Sartre, right? That point out that anxiety is actually structural to the human being. We better damn well feel anxious because we're absolutely free when we make our choices. We can choose anything. We can choose to keep our jobs. We can choose to quit our jobs. We can choose we can choose any any bloody thing. And Sartre actually Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir both point out that suicide is even an option for us, right? So every moment we choose not to kill ourselves, that's a pretty fundamental kind of choice, right? But we are responsible, right? If we're absolutely free, then we're absolutely responsible. And dealing with this freedom and responsibility is the human task. I don't care what your job is, your first job is to be a human being, and that job is framed by making choices, right? So the ethical is the first responsibility of the human being, right? So this is Kierkegaard's first salvo into um, the, 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 the existential, the religious existential um, kind of dilemma. Right? Now, very quickly, um, I'm going to just conclude this first video, uh, which I'm going to call anxiety because I mentioned anxiety in here, but nonetheless, um, uh, the, the next video will focus in heavily on sickness unto death. Um, by pointing out um, the ugliest passage. Um, just a quick word about why Kierkegaard writes the way Kierkegaard writes, and you're probably getting a, the philosopher's hairline. What's this guy trying to say to me? You see, it fits perfectly there, right? Well, Kierkegaard is asking simple, simple kind of questions, right? How do we make choices? How do we look ourselves in the mirror? Right? But, if we ask those choices in simple ways, the funny thing that happens to most of us is that we give simple answers 
which make us feel as though we have an understanding of our situation, an understanding of these dynamics. What he's doing is asking simple questions in complicated, strange ways to show that we don't really understand and to provoke us into thinking in a complicated way about these aspects that are so fundamental to being a human being right, that we tend to take them for granted. Right? So basically what Kierkegaard says in one of his dialogues is that some people have an ability to um, make things simple, to simplify. Right? And uh, there are entire series of books that frankly do this that are, you know, insulting to the reader right off the bat. Who, who, who reads an idiot's guide and thinks, oh, he'll, he'll, I'm that idiot, right? No, right? What Kierkegaard wants to do and what he feels his skill is, is to rather make things complicated, right? To take something that we all regard as simple and to complicate it to the point where it provokes us to think about it in a new way. Right? So you'll see references to Socrates in here because, as Broderick pointed out in the Socrates video that I posted for you, I mean, effectively, the human edge, the dangerous kind of philosophy, catches a society at a moment of weakness with regard to ideas and terms and concepts and dispositions right? that hold it together. Right? and asks really tough questions at that moment of weakness. Right? So, effectively, that's the language, the point of the language that Kierkegaard is using in both the concept of anxiety and more to the point in um, Sickness Unto Death. Right? Um, the language, as Roderick will point out to you, in Sickness Unto Death, right, specifically, is um, sort of a pot shot at another philosopher by the name of George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, right, um, who wrote a nice little book by the name of The Phenomenology of Spirit, among others, kind of thing, and is largely considered to be the pinnacle of this modern systematic kind of thought, right? This is the last of the grand systems to come out of the Enlightenment, right? And um, it's frankly dizzying, right? Here's, here's a little um, uh, here's a little one line um, from, from Observing Reason in Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. Individually, individuality gives up that uh, reflectedness into self, which is expressed in lines and uh, lineaments and places its essence in the work it has done. Herein, it contradicts the relationship established by the instinct of... Re you see, this is the way he writes, right? But nonetheless, it all, if you concentrate really, really hard, actually fits together in a well-reasoned kind of system. Now, Kierkegaard was kind of making fun of this language when he wrote Sickness Unto Death. So this is, this is sort of a joke, right, that Kierkegaard is making, right? And largely the joke rests on the fact that um, Kierkegaard takes it that these kinds of systems, well, they're beautiful systems, but they're not written in a way that are ever going to be helpful or useful to the existing individual. Right? You can say from a top-down perspective how one ought to act, right? but does that really help the individual in the situation, in the heat of the moment, as an individual? Kierkegaard thought not. Right? So, sure, this is where I fit as a cog into a giant wheel, right? but how do I make friends with being wrapped up in this world filled with bureaucracies and systems, right? And how do I live a life that's meaningful to me is the main question to Kierkegaard. So basically Kierkegaard is taking a pot shot at Hegel by using the kind of language that Hegel would here. 
Now, this is one of the ugliest passages, and um, it will will linger on this quite a bit in the next video. Um, that that I'm going to introduce you to this uh, this 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 semester. It's on page one uh, three fifty one of um, your essential Kierkegaard, and it's the first paragraph of Sickness Unto Death. And it reads, a human being is spirit. But what is spirit? Spirit is the self. But what is the self? The self is a relation that relates itself to itself or is the relations relating itself to itself in the relation. The self is not the relation, but is the relations relating itself to itself. A human being is a synthesis of the infinite and the finite. Okay. To a certain extent, that harkens back to um, to 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 anxiety. It's, I've got an infinite number of things that I can choose, but I'm a finite being, and eventually I'm going to choose one. The temporal and the eternal of freedom and necessity, in short, a synthesis. And a synthesis is a relationship between two. Considered in this way, a human being is still not a self. Right. So effectively. Right. This is Kierkegaard's definition of the human being. Um, in the next video, I'm going to go over that passage in detail. Right. So, um, that will be the next thing we will turn to.